In this episode of Mind Pump, the world's top fitness, health, and entertainment podcast, we answer fitness and health questions that are asked by viewers and listeners just like you. They go to our Instagram page, they post questions, we pick the best ones, and then we answer them in these episodes. Now, the way we open this episode is with the introductory portion. This is where we talk about current events, things that are in the news, talk about our lives. Sometimes we mention sponsors. In today's episode, the intro portion was 38 minutes long. So if you want just the fitness stuff, you can fast forward, get to the fitness questions. If you want to have fun, though, yeah. start at the very Stick beginning. Around. By the way, you can actually see everything time stamped uh, with our every episode, every podcast, and you can find exactly what you want to listen to or what question you want us to answer. Just go to mindpumppodcast.com. So let me give you a breakdown of this episode. We open up by talking about... Nicholas Cage, he's hey. that uh, that actor from the '90s and early 2000s. He's in everything. That's uh, that might be in some him and little, Kevin Bacon. A little bit of trouble. Uh, then we talked about uh, Justin's wife, Courtney. We talked all mm. about that and her trip we shouldn't to have done that to Safari to that Safari place. <laughs> yeah. Then I talked about the Russia's uh, phase three trial of their vaccine on their population. They're going to just test it on oh everybody. Oh my god! Pray for them. Find out what's going on. Then I talked about exercise and its effect on your immune system. Some cool studies just came out showing the positive impact. It's really powerful on your immune system. Exercise is essential, Sal. Then we talked about baseball. That was boring. Uh, then we talked about the show no, on <laughs> on Netflix called Love on the Spectrum. Super endearing. Highly recommended. Great show. Um, then we talked about a company that we're working with called Pluto. They make customizable pillows. So these are pillows that you can actually customize to your height, your weight, if you like your pillows to be warm or cool, um, a lot of different things. And as a result, you sleep way better. The experience is amazing with this company. And sleep is so important for health, fat loss, and muscle building. And your pillow actually makes a pretty bit big impact on that. And because you're listening to Mind Pump, you get a discount. So here's what you do. Go to PlutoPillow.com. That's P-L-U-T-O-P-I-L-L-O-W.com forward slash mind pump. You fill out the questionnaire to get an individualized pillow recommended to you. And then use the code mind pump and you'll get a full 10% off. Then I talked about Adam's long legs and Justin's short legs. Yeah, which is inaccurate. Which led me to talk about uh, our sponsor, Viori, that now increased the seam size for women's pants in their lineup. Viore makes amazing athleisure wear clothing with a lifetime guarantee, okay? So for as long as you own the product, if something happens, return it, get a brand yeah. new one. Uh, if you're doing karate kicks like me, you still uh, can send them back. He practices karate yeah. all the time at night. If you want the Mind Pump discount, which is huge, 25% off, here's what you got to do. Go to vioreclothing.com. That's V-U-O-R-I clothing.com forward slash Mind Pump, and you'll get that 25% off. And then we talk about long-term health and financial wealth. Then we got into answering the questions. Here's the first one. This person wants to know how to add isometric or dynamic tension exercises into their routine. In terms of isometric and dynamic training, which, by the way, have tremendous uh, value for muscle building, strength, and performance, that is actually in our performance MAPS performance program. We do put isometrics in there. That program, by the way, is also 50% off all month long. Just go to mapsgreen.com, that's M-A-P-S-G-R-E-E-N.com, and then use the code GREEN50, that's G-R-E-E-N-5-0, no space for the 50% off discount. By the way, there's an at-home mod added to that, so you can actually follow the whole workout with just a pair of dumbbells. The next question, this person wants to know why processed foods add so much water under the skin. Why do I get so bloated when I have uh, processed foods? The third question this person wants to know what our thoughts are on intra workout carbohydrates. Are they valuable? And the final question this person wants to know if foam rolling should be done before or after a workout. Also, we are launching a brand new MAPS workout program. Da, 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 da. Now, this next program is exceptional because, besides the fact that it builds a lot of muscle, burns body fat, gets you fit, like all MAPS programs. This one is exceptional for at home or basically anywhere type Super workouts. Super convenient. It's MAPS suspension. So this program uses f suspension trainers. That's it. So all you need are a pair of suspension trainers, and you can follow the full workout and train your entire body, you know, shoulders, biceps, triceps, back, chest, your core, Beats. your legs, your butt, uh, everything with this entire program. Suspension trainers are very versatile. 
This program is appropriate for everybody. If you're a beginner, you adjust the leverage to make it easy. If you're advanced, this workout can really kick your butt. Now, because it's a brand new launch and it's a brand new program, and of course, uh, this program, like all of the MAPS programs, is fully instructional. Okay, so you go in there, you got video demos, how many rep sets. I mean, basically, it's a personal trainer on your computer. It, because it's a launch, we're offering it at discount. This is a very, very short time that we're offering this. But every time we launch a brand new MAPS program, this is what we do. So if you want to take a look at MAPS suspension and get the $20 off that we're offering, which is the launch price, here's what you got to do. Go to mapssuspension.com. That's M-A-P-S-S-U-S-P-E-N-S-I-O-N.com. And then use the code SUSPENSION20. So that's the word SUSPENSION and the number 20, no space. That'll give you $20 off and you'll get the full program sent to your email and access for life. Hey, Justin, did you know yeah. Did you know that uh, Nicolas Cage's son, you ever hear about his son? No, I haven't heard anything <laughs> about his son. Guy, Only Nick Cage. This is a picture of him. What? what? <laughs> <laughs> Look at this. So this is Nicolas Cage's uh, son. Oh, dude. He, he looks like he's in a death metal. He is. And he, in fact, he, he used to be in a black metal band. That's dude. what and he invented a type of music called ghost metal. Ghost <laughs> so metal? There's pictures of Nicolas Cage walking with his son, and he's like dark eye makeup and straight black hair wow. and all black clothes, and he looks like Dude, a demon that, walking next to his dad. That's the most amazing thing. If you're, a, if you're a, the, the kid of a Hollywood star- It's like, like you have to be weird. I was going to say, what are the, yeah. what are the shots? You're, either one, I think you become an actor, actress, or a, just a fucking weirdo. Yeah. So then I went down this rabbit hole of Nicolas Cage. So I'm like, what is this all about? Like, what's his son band you know, into or what, all that stuff? Yeah, what's his band name? And then I found this, dude. So Nicolas Cage blew a $150 million fortune. So he, he, had, a, he had a fortune of $150 million. What? Dude. Bankrupt. No wonder he's in every film. Bro, he bank, could possibly do. Bankrupt. So he would purchase things like, and it was totally like. So this Nicolas Cage went bankrupt, not his son. No. Too. Nicolas Cage, well, I'm sure, you know, by proxy now, his son's bankrupt too, right? Because right. I don't know how much money his son makes with his, his ghost metal band. <laughs> what did he do with $150 million? Well, so in 2009, he owed $6.3 million in property taxes. But here's some of his purchases that are hilarious. At one point, he bought a dinosaur skull. <laughs> for for three hundred for three hundred thousand dollars. Do you know I that's mean, like, that's what you do? No, that's like so. I was watching what show was that? I'm watching some. My sister turned me on to like one of these like crazy exotic homes that are like thirty, forty, hundred million dollar homes, and that's like a thing. Like if you if you got that kind of money where you buy hundred million dollar homes, <laughs> what kind of prehistoric. No, uh, they do. do you they have? like the, like that's the always yeah. like part of the decor is always like some Over dinosaur raptor, some dinosaur chair. relic that costs yeah. like one point <laughs> two million, some bones. Like really, yeah. this yeah. this this toilet paper is made from Egyptian yeah. mummy wrappings. You know, the three thousand. <laughs> so so and that reminds me of. Did you guys ever watch the Chappelle Show? Yeah. Do you remember the episode where he was acting like a super rich uh, actor, and then he's like, yeah. it's like it's like uh, what is it like a uh, cribs and. Oh, cribs, cribs, yeah, yeah. And the camera's on him, and he opens his fridge to make breakfast, and he has like a, a raptor egg that he cracks <laughs> <laughs> into the pan and scrambles it up. Yeah. So here, here, there's more. He had a prehistoric be uh, bear skull that was worth hundreds of thousands of dollars that he accidentally destroyed when he was playing pool. Oops. One day, uh. he bought uh, uh, islands in the Bahamas worth you know millions and millions of dollars. At one point, he owned 15 residences simultaneously. Included, including a $25 million waterfront home in Newport Beach. Uh, he had another $15 million countryside estate in uh, Rhode Island. Uh, another $8 million estate in Las Vegas. Oh, my Dang, God. He was just spending it like it was never going to go dude, away. He like bought he two, Leveraged it to all hell to have all that. Dude, he bought two uh, European castles. One was an 11th century Bavarian castle in Germany. What? <laughs> yeah. His cars, like his son, probably lives there. Bro, like you have now. if uh, you have to fire your accountant. Dude, that's what that, he's blaming it on his accountant. Oh, is that what he's doing? Yes, dude. <laughs> because his accountant didn't <laughs> yeah. say shit. Dude, at one point he bought a Lamborghini off of the Shah of Iran that cost him half a million dollars. So anyway, these are, I mean, yeah, normal purchases. Yeah. He at one point it gets better. At one point he owned four <clears throat> yachts all at once. What? One of them worth twenty dude, million dollars. I did not know Nick Cage was balling like that. Yeah, yeah, that had twelve master bedrooms, dude. Yeah, you're, he he leveraged the hell yeah. out of himself. Yeah. 
Uh, now, what do you, when you, that, all that con air, when you read all that, what is, what do you think what, as a, as a person, like, why are you doing that? Like, what's your, what's your read on that? I think you're, I think you're trying to find excitement in life. Maybe you're bored. Mm. So it's kind of like an addiction. You know, people get that like shopping addiction. This is just, he has a lot of money. Yeah. So it goes crazy. It gets funnier, dude. He bought this haunted house. That apparently at one point belonged to serial killer Madame Delphine Lalaurie. What? So in, in New Orleans, which between, this is a true story. I don't know if you guys ever, do you guys ever watch that show, American Ghost Horror Hunters? Story? No, oh. American Horror Story. Yeah. They based this character off of her. So between 1787 and 1849, she tortured and murdered countless uh, slaves that she owned in her household. So he bought that house because he thought, oh, this is interesting. Yeah, buy that. Yeah. yeah. At one point, he bought a tombstone that was. <laughs> <laughs> it was nine foot tall pyramid shaped tombstone in the uh, stone in the oldest cemetery in New Orleans. <laughs> so I mean, this goes to show that you could have lots of money and still be totally broke. Yeah, because of the way you manage. Now, when did he officially go bankrupt? I don't know when that happened. So officially. I mean, like, like but I mean, he's like, not doing movies anymore. I know, so. but like, where's he at today? Is he? I mean, is he completely? You know, I, I gotta imagine you you bought something cash, right? You gotta have something paid <laughs> he's off. A ghostwriter, right? They gotta they gotta have something paid off, and he's living somewhere okay. Yeah. Right? Well, this was an article that I read. Uh, this is new, new article, August twenty twenty. Mm. Oh shit! Yeah. So this this must have must have recently kind of been something that happened. But, wow. Yeah, and I mean, think about it. If okay, you, you're worth 150 million dollars, but you have so much debt, so much leverage. You're, you're leveraging so much that your bills turn out to be more than what you can, what you have. So yeah. you're screwed. It really has nothing to do with how much money you have, as how much money you spend. You know Imagine I mean? if like Warren Buffett spent money like that. Yeah, like all these like conservative guys. He's the he com- <laughs> complete opposite. Yeah, I know. Exactly. Yeah. That's the thing. It's just funny to see the difference of how people spend their money. Yeah. On, on funny stories. So I have to bring this up because we talked about this, I want to say like four weeks ago. When did I bring up the Safari West thing? I brought, well, that was I, like three or four episodes ago. Right. It was, it was a little while ago though. I brought it up, right? Mm-hmm. And so I'm talking to Katrina about it <clears throat> and I said, hey, did you know that uh, Courtney went and and because Justin brought it up, oh yeah, Courtney's been there. But you yeah. know what Justin did not share about that story? What that I, which I always find funny when he tells stories and he leaves things out like this. What happened? Yeah. Do you know that she was there for a bachelorette party at, uh, at, at a safari yeah. park? At yeah. a. The- <laughs> What? Well, it, I mean, it's lame. Why would I bring that up? <laughs> well, because I heard that I heard that the, the Safari West people said that they never in history have they ever had a bachelorette party there. It's because well, the 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 girl was uh, uh, pregnant, I believe. And so she thought that going to yeah, a, so she a, thought that going there would be like a I don't know a kid thing a kid with yeah, your kid I, in your belly dude I have no idea <laughs> hold on a second yeah, don't ask me <laughs> I wasn't the one organizing hold it. on a second I, I gotta, just felt that was a yeah. really funny fact that was not shared <laughs> about that I totally story. forgot about that <laughs> yeah. I got a few questions for you okay, okay all right okay do yes. they does she have a thing for like you know safari guys. You know, like, or zookeepers, Who, you know? Courtney? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is that why they picked it? No, I think she's got more of a thing for cowboys. Yeah. Oh, is that? Yeah, that, I well, told Courtney, you Courtney that. had no decision in it. She was attending oh, it. She was right. attending it. It was yeah, some yeah, other yeah. girl who decided to do that's, it. I just oh. thought that was, you know, I, I, and I don't know if you guys have friends that have done kind of Come on, off. girls, let's rage and look at the giraffes. Yeah, I, I right, had a buddy that had kind of an ooh, off, like, elephant. bachelor yeah. party, you know, that was not, like, we went to Vegas and we did nothing like Vegas, right? We did all this other stuff, like racing cars and we, you know, played cards and we just we just did shit that wasn't like related to like Vegas that you would yeah. think of, mm-hmm. but nothing like that off like where you go to a, a safari, which is literally the entire park <laughs> has to be filled with children, you know, <laughs> and you're there with a bachelorette party, a bunch of girls that want to get drunk. And yeah, sleep. I don't know, man. I don't know what it, like the the landscape looks. I thought it was just like a winery that also had animals. You know, that's as much information <laughs> as I got. So it's literally like a children's park. Oh wow, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, hey. Do you just know? Getting Teach s- their own. Getting smashed on mimosas and throwing Cheetos at the, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, at the giraffes. Yeah, or, the ostrich yeah. You know, in the morning. Hey, speaking of Courtney, what was, you did a st- uh, Q&A on your Instagram. <laughs> oh, oh, bro, that was, yeah. did you, you see that? Asshole. Well, of course yeah. I saw yeah, that. Yeah, I got a message from both him and Courtney for that. So yeah, guess, I was like, come on, man. <laughs> you got to explain what happened. I well, I every like, time, okay, every time we do those things, uh, you know, there's always somebody in there that, you know, makes like a, fl- and it's, actually, I believe it was a guy who f- was flirting with me. Mm. Makes some happens kind. a lot. Yeah, well, Justin, no, all three of us get it. I've seen all of you guys. You yeah, get the, you do. get the Silver Fox comment. Justin always gets like, you're the most handsome one of mm. all of them. You get a lot of guys though. Yeah, I get a lot of guys yeah, that yeah. do that, right? So yeah. you were definitely the hottest one, right? That's why I got that. And so I, re- uh. 
what people can't see, like when you do the Q&A, all they can see is the question. They can't see who who uh, writes the question. So I like to fuck around. Adam with gets like, the hungry ones. So, yeah. yeah. I, I, I thanked- uh, <laughs> They Cor- think they have a chance. I thanked Courtney Andrews and I tagged her, you know? Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I, I was gotta, like, come I gotta, on, dude. Yeah. I don't even want her on there to begin with. And now it's like, it's getting this flood of people over there. You know what I mean? <laughs> are they, oh, really? Are people, because start- yeah. he tagged her, like following yeah, her? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, I, ro- oh. I rolled Doug under the bus too. I never, he never checks them. So I like always like messing with him too. So somebody asked me about something about where to get like a, a good deal on dumbbells or who has or where we could find some. I don't know what it was, but I, I posted. Oh, you posted. Was that his real address? No, it wasn't okay, I was going to yeah, say. Yeah, but like, I'm sure hella people looked it up and was like trying to. Well, funny. I did get, you <laughs> we know, found him. you guys are assholes and Adam, you in particular. I did get a couple weird uh, <laughs> messages that time you wrote my phone number in the bathroom. Uh, up in Tahoe. That was me. Yeah, was that you? <laughs> yeah, that was me. Oh, I felt like that was an Adam thing. You, I know. That, that you, was, a, yeah, it was a sneaky you asshole. You jerk. Move. Yeah, I, I got a couple weird <laughs> messages like, hey, went, huh? With like three Y's. Yeah. Like, that's a weird way to say it. You're into anchovies and a good time. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what it's said. <laughs> yeah. There's always weird people out there. Yeah. Anyway, I got some, there's some good news uh, right now in the world. What's that? Yeah, so. Well, a, that's rare. A COVID 19. Phase three trial oh. is underway now. There's a little bit of a weird caveat to that. It's in Russia. Uh, it's being it's yes. the, the the phase three trial is being done on the population of Russia. So <laughs> that's not so yeah. Russia apparently like forced on them has a vaccine that they said uh, you know this is going to work, but no human trials yet. But they haven't done a phase three type trial of it. it so what they're doing is they're giving it to the public. So we're going to get the results from a very large uh, sample of people. Huh. We're going to be using the vaccine to see how it, you know, how it plays Thanks, out. Thanks, Russian yeah. people. You know what's the, you know here's the thing about vaccines that people need to understand. This is true. I looked this up because I thought, okay, what are the dangers? Because not all vaccines are the same. It's not like I think a lot of people think that they're um, benign, mm-hmm. like kind of like the way our attitudes were about antibiotics for a while. I remember as a kid, antibiotics were they were they were they were passed out like candy because yeah. it was like no big deal. Now we know they're not all the same. Some might have some bad side effects. There may be some issues related with some of them, and you definitely don't want to abuse them. Not all vaccines are the same. I did not know this, but there were tests in the past uh, on a SARS vaccine. SARS is also a coronavirus. It's Mm -hmm. a different type of coronavirus. And they tested it on animals, and they found that it built up antibodies. So that seems like a good, uh, you know, like a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then they exposed the animals to the SARS virus. And for whatever reason, whatever the vaccine did, it basically guaranteed they died. Oh shit! So wow. then the animals got the, va- the 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 virus, and they their death rate went through the roof. This has happened with other uh, trials of other types of vaccines. <laughs> Way to scare well, the shit scary. out of everybody. Yeah, like, <laughs> well, this is why this is why there's a the, you know that why there's typically a vaccine takes ten years of testing and stuff like that. So I'm not trying to be anti. Mm. I'm just saying you know you want to kind of be careful, and we do want to allow them. Uh, to test uh, all the stuff because you don't want the medicine to be worse um, than the now. Day. Are they just testing one particular vaccine uh, amongst the population, or the multiple? The one that they approved. Uh-huh. Now they're going to be giving to people. So <clears throat> it does sound like a it also the opening to a bad sci-fi. I, I know, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Oh, we yeah. cured the disease. Oh, what? Why is everybody oh, turning oh, into a zombie? Whole, yeah, half the world zombies. Yeah. Now. Uh, along those lines, um, some new studies came out on exercise um, and the immune system. This is actually pretty exciting. Uh, we've all known now for a while that being fit and healthy just m- gives you a stronger immune system. Uh, but it's kind of mixed as to how much of an impact it has on your immune system in terms of how many less infections, for example, would you get? Well, there was a, a big study that came out, and they found that adults who engaged in exercise five days a week had 43% fewer days with upper respiratory symptoms over a 12-week period than those who exercised no more than once a week. Another study found that adults who exercised three days a week were 26% less likely to have the common cold during a year-long uh, period. Those are big numbers. Well, the first one's big obvious numbers. to me. The second one, I think, is more important, right? The, the fact that you, uh, that you would have 40% less symptoms because you uh, in respiratory systems when you're training the respiratory system while you're No, exercising. fewer days with, yeah, with symptoms. You're right, right. Yeah. So, I mean, like that's kind of obvious, right? Your body adapts to it. You're training it while you're working out all the time. So, you're, of course, it's going to be stronger and more resilient when that happens. I don't think we needed a study for that. But that you, 26% 
less people even got it is what I think is is probably more important. Yeah, well, mm-hmm. I think this highlights the thing that a, a lot of us forget, which is that your a hundred percent your your number one defense against <laughs> any illness is your immune system. Mm-hmm. And I remember I know this. Uh, I remember learning this, or really becoming aware aware of it. I should say when I had a family member who was being treated for cancer. And I remember when she was under treatment, they were like, she cannot be exposed to any virus because the chemo basically destroyed her immune system for a short period of time. And something as simple as the sniffles uh, would have turned deadly right away. Yeah, it's deadly. In fact, they were so ready to prescribe her antibiotics at the first sign of anything because her immune system. You guys have heard of the, like the, it was an old movie in the 80s. Uh, I don't remember what it was called. Bubble Boy, I think it was. Yeah. You guys remember that? I remember Bubble oh, Boy, wow. yeah. You remember that movie? I do. That was about a kid whose immune system wasn't developed, so he had to live in a sterile um, like environment constantly, and any exposure to any virus or bacteria def- would basically kill him, regardless of antibiotics yeah. or whatever. So we got to remember that that kind of stuff, you know. Stay healthy, fit, get sunlight. Yeah, that needs that message needs to be promoted a lot more. I just don't see that enough. It, it, everything is so politicized now that uh, you know, like people just need to understand that they need to take care of themselves, take care of their body, eat, you know, in a way that's going to benefit their body, exercise, make these a priority because we do need to make sure that our immune system is strong yep. and resilient. Yeah. I feel like one of the side effects of modern medicine, which has done a great job at battling infection and has done a great job of saving people from acute illness. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the side effects is we we feel like the you know, oh that'll save me. I don't need to worry so much about being healthy, you know, <clears throat> which is is not the case. A person with a really strong immune system usually will do better than somebody with a bad immune system who's got access to all these uh, you know medications oh, and yeah. drugs because that's the first line. Of defense. Dude, so I, I I brought up the other day um, about uh, I was watching the the uh, Major League Baseball and uh, so I actually watched another game. I watched the A's game versus the uh, Astros and then how they got in like a brawl and everything oh, yeah. uh, over that. Uh, yeah, but what I didn't know, which was interesting, because you know how they have all those cardboard cutouts in in the stands and everything. Yeah, was so you pay for that and you put you know people in place there. Um, I guess uh, when the ball hits. When you're, oh, you're you think, get the ball. You get the ball. Oh, that's they cool. They send you the ball. I was that's like, cool. That is such a cool idea, you know. So that way, at least there's some interaction, and, oh. and you know, you get you get something out of you it. You got to give it to these big leagues. They are getting creative with ways to like. I I, I so I saw. I I haven't been watching the NBA. I told you guys that the other day that I, I stopped watching it, but I have seen stuff on news. And the the Phoenix Suns did this really cool. So the players come out and they, before every game, you announce the starting lineup. Oh, you're starting point guard six three, blah blah blah. They, and then they they come out right. That's like a, that's normally how basketball starts. Mm-hmm. What they did was they had recorded because they're all in Florida having to do the do this like and they're, so they're away from their families. They actually had the families announce the like their kids and their you know siblings and and like their families announce them for the game. So on oh, the big cool. on the yeah on the big screen and on the TV oh, that's nice. when the players came and the players didn't know right. So when uh, they they come out like they go all emotional and stuff like that because they haven't seen their kids and stuff and then they get to see them announce him. I thought that was really clever yeah. and original. Like they, you see a lot that that's happening right now. I think they're trying to find ways. Yeah, there's there's little bits of drama and little cool things that they're adding. Like uh, so the other thing was you remember so baseball is very ritualistic and has like lots of like curses and things yeah. like you know and so th- there's been a lot of petty stuff that people have done already like uh, so in Chicago at Wrigley uh, when they're going in playoffs you, I don't know if you guys remember about Bartman and the guy that of basically course. yeah so most people that watch sports know about that and uh, so basically I, I don't know if it was the the Florida Marlins again like like somebody like a fan of theirs put Bartman, the cardboard oh, cutout wow. in oh, Wrigley. Oh, that's so great. Like, dude. So, because you could buy, I, I could buy a, a seat, right? So, that's yeah. how this works. And then the, it's a cardboard cutout of whatever I want. So, I heard they were doing that. I heard they, they were. They did it with Weekend of Bernie's. Yeah, I yeah. saw that. They did yeah. that with Weekend. Yeah. Remember yeah. the Weekend of yeah. Bernie's? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was behind the, the, the plate, home, you know, yeah, home, home plate, plate or whatever. Yeah. And I feel like. so Pretty the, funny. So, the ratings are still not good. I've been kind of paying attention to that. And the ratings aren't good. However,. After I've seen these pictures and memes of like, you know, Weekend at Bernie's back there or whatever, I feel like the fans might actually save 
yeah. the ratings because I know, that's going to become a thing. It's clever. Where it people is. are going to look in the in the audience well, to ju- find... Well, just like Justin said, I mean, that's a big deal. Like in Wrigley Field, like the whole Bartman curse is a huge fucking oh, deal. So I don't know deal. what that is. Okay, so there's a guy like that that reached over... And and gr- and caught oh. a ball instead of allowing it to play. I know. And he and was they, a Cubs fan, which yeah. is the worst part. Yes, <laughs> yeah. and that and they ended up losing right because of that. And yeah. so that was a big that for well, they got, rallied five runs that inning. Yeah, I believe. Yeah, after after that, like they were all, they, it was the third out. Or, or yeah, it was like they they were able to get like out of the inning, and he ruined it because he he reached out and, and prevented him from catching it. You know what's the the interesting thing about superstitions is that they they're real. If you believe in them, right. they're not real. If you don't, right, right, you know right. what I mean. Yeah. So if you've got like the wrong coincidence, or yeah, yeah. that's well, why that's that's why great. it's so great. Is because there's there's not a Cubs fan one that doesn't believe that and thinks it's a major curse. And then you have then now if you're a rival team. So if I'm a Marlins fan, we're coming into Wrigley Field. It's a hilarious thing for me to make a cutout of that guy yeah. and put it in the stands. Well, yeah, because it's going to piss hilarious. off all the oh, oh. That's, yeah. So that's that's oh, hilarious. I mean, it's like if you think if you have the wrong socks on, you're not going to play well, and you believe that, and then you have the wrong socks on, you're not going to play well dude so much of sports though i mean it's in the psychology that's why you have sports psychologists uh, is now like a profession that like athletes at the top level they really have to invest in their mind like in, in making sure their mindset is right going yeah. in my Ta- favorite stories are the ones where uh and i don't think this happens anymore but this was like in the 70s and 80s when pitchers or players would show up and play like on a lot of drugs there was, yeah, a, was yeah. that one. There was that like one Darryl picture. Strawberry you think that doesn't happen still today? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I, you think it still happens? Of course, it still oh, dude, happens, dude, bro. Dude, lines of blood. Yeah, the drugs are just different. Uh, They're better. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> what? Back then, back then they're experimenting with stuff. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like, oh, let's try this and see if I can play on coke and see how who I is, do. You who was that one player that yeah. that pitched a, like a no hitter, but like hella acid? He was on hella uh, acid. Is a uh, good one, right? Doc Goodwin. Is that Doc what it is? Yeah. I think that's who's who it was who's famous for being like. He's like the Yankees or the Mets, right? Yeah. Yeah, That's, I, I could not that. imagine. Look up, I just remember the Mets were just riddled with like drug use. You could even put famous pitcher on, on drugs. Acid. Yeah, on dr- I think it was Doc Goodwin. Is it? I feel bad if it's not. Doc much. Ellis. Oh, oh Ellis. Ellis. Sorry. Look at that. He, yeah. Uh, f- played for Pittsburgh. Pirates. He went and threw a no hitter despite being high on a kite on uh, acid. Acid. Yeah. yeah. He, <laughs> How do you play on acid? It's crazy. He got on. He's. I guess he was partying and then he got on a plane because he didn't realize he had a game. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then I mean, he, he had to get on a plane and an hour later. Here's he my playing. theory. He's on, in flow state. My theory on like drugs and stuff like that in in professional sports is that, and we we think because we're in the fitness space and so we're aware of like you know the latest nootropic that's out. I think professional sports is is five years to 10 years ahead of us. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about millions and millions of dollars for athletes. You want to talk about where the cutting edge science is going for drugs. Are you really trying to have the limitless drug? Are you trying to make a case for being on hella acid to play a sport? No, I'm just, what I'm, what I'm (laughs) saying is that it not only has been happening since then, I don't think I, cause I was, you were alluding that it used to be like that. I think it's no different. If anything, it's just, it's more, it's more tested, and they're aware of like what's the new cutting edge shit, and they're I guarantee they know how to guys, hide it in their pee. Yeah, yeah, no, there's way more. Well, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, if you're making, you know, if you've got a contract worth a hundred million dollars and you're worth that much money to the team, I wouldn't be surprised if you have some special doctor and scientist that hook you of up course. with your special formula before you. Oh, of yeah. course, it reminds me of uh, uh, like most things do. Rocky Four with the Russian when they're hooking him up with the machines. <laughs> yeah. <and all. laughs> Dude, Every, look, look at Lance Armstrong. Everything relates right? the, to a rock yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You brought up socks and you just, rem- just Sal, you said something about socks and it reminded me of uh, Justin, I think it was Justin who turned us on to the Netflix series, The Love on the Spectrum. Yeah, oh, it was yeah. so good. It yeah. was really good. I watched so the whole, good. Did you oh, guys watch the you whole thing? It. Yes. Yeah. I watched the whole thing too. It's the, it, I loved it, it. It's literally the most endearing thing. It, was, one, it was really good. Yeah, Dude. if you want to actually feel good because the world is not providing any positive things. Like that's such a positive show. Oh yeah, these are people who obviously are on the spectrum of autism and they're so honest they're, yeah. they can't really be fake and then they have their own anxieties and their own quirks right they're so likable yeah i don't remember the one dude's name the one guy uh he's got like they're a, all like from australia i think for the most part or yeah i think they were in australia there was the one dude he's got like a big family and he's really funny on accident yeah. you know he'll say but super straight uh, yeah that was well, my favorite guy yeah, yeah. oh yeah. he made me he, I, I mean and then that one girl who 
like to, who jumped a lot when she got really yeah. excited or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I didn't I don't know. Did you guys just want to hug them? Yeah. yeah no, it was. A, I wasn't when Justin first brought it up. Uh, I wasn't sure what it was supposed to be like. I wasn't. I like, was afraid that it would have been one of those things where you're laughing dating shows or where or, you're laughing at them, which uh, would have made me really mad. No, you know, yeah, I wouldn't. But I it wouldn't was, promote that. It was not like that. It's very endearing. You feel uh, a lot of compet. You just love them. They're so likable. And you want to see them make it. And then that one couple that was already together and super in love. Yeah. And they're just both. He was so good to her. Like, oh. Doing all those things. for. Yeah, I also was just telling Katrina, like, uh, what a rewarding job to be that lady. I know. Uh, what a cool job. Like, you uh, you help all of these. Because like, really all it is is yeah. just they, they, they lack the social skills. They're brilliant in other things, right? Brilliant minds in other aspects of their life. They just, they lack the social skills, but it doesn't mean they can't be taught that. It doesn't yeah. mean like it's gone and they don't ever get it. It's just, they're at a lower level than most people at their age, but you can totally expand on and you can watch how she's p- helping them piece it together. Oh, the oh part- and you see how, how tough it's been on their parents. You that. Know, that, that was the one I was like, oh, that hit me. Cause it, you just imagine like how much work they've had to, you know, put into this to try and get them at least so they could be social enough to interact, you know, in the real world and like, you know make their own living and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's the part that really got to me because obviously I'm a father and you guys are now, you know, you in Adam, you're a new dad and to you and you know what a parent's love is like. Mm-hmm. So to watch the parents talk about their kids and and be so happy and the fathers get emotional a couple times talking about how far their kids have come. Yeah, yeah it hits you it, right in the heart because you know you would do you would you would go through fire. Well, we have a, yeah. we have a mutual friend that has a son that's autistic, mm. and every time he talks about the whole, I mean, it's completely changed his life. I mean, mm. for the good too. I mean, it's made him a better man just having to deal with it. And I, I always like I always get emotional listening to him talk about like what he's go what he's going through to try and, and figure. Some of out. the best people I've ever uh, known were parents who had uh, challenge you know had challenging circumstances with their children because mm-hmm. I think. That that love for your child, which is probably one of the most powerful feelings you could have ever, pushes you to be the like the best person you can mm-hmm. in the face of that kind of uh, challenge. All your priorities are in the right place. Absolutely. And so, yeah. so watching that and hearing them talk, I'm, I'm sitting there. I'm like, I mean, Jessica and I are watching. I'm like, am I going to cry? Yeah, trying to cry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I have a, a cool announcement. I, I think we've uh, alluded to this the last uh, month and a half or so that we were bringing on some some new partners. I believe this is the last one to introduce uh, right now. Um, that I'm really excited about. One of the spaces that um, always I'm looking for is uh, natural ways to help improve sleep. We talk about sleep all the time. We, we just had a, an episode where we talked about all the different steps to improve that and the importance of sleep and how overrated or uh, <clears throat> underrated it is and how many, how many people don't pay attention to that, how mm-hmm. long it took us to piece that together as trainers. And then, of course, we're also not fans of using things to to get better sleep or using drugs or stuff like that to help that like the natural way for you to get better rest at night uh, we know that the blue blockers have been one of the great partners for that and then now we have a new one that we're introducing and that's pluto pillow which was really cool um i got a chance to you know like we talk about always anytime we have a new partner we court them for a while i got a chance to meet the ceo we talked for a long old time when i first talked to her you know, she told me her story and what inspired her to actually do this. And I guess I never really thought about this. Um, I think every time I've ever bought a pillow, it just happens to be when I'm buying like a comforter or a bed set. Yeah. I, right. just, I just get just it. Like, How's it feel? Is it good? Yeah. yeah, yeah or they literally just like throw it. Yeah, here you go or yeah. whatever. But she's like, have you ever shopped online for a pillow? And I was like, no. She's like, And she like waited for me. Get online and go try and do it real quick. And so I get online and sure as shit, it's like you get like 3,000 like <laughs> ran- options, options. Yeah. and there's just not a lot of detail to them you know it's all around branding like if you know like the brand yeah. of, of of the pillow that's it but as far as what's this pillow gonna feel like and it's online you're completely clueless to what the experience might be and then a lot of times people buy them and it's just like whatever so you're reading through reviews to try and figure it out right she goes so the the process is just so laborious and it's terrible and that she goes i thought there was a huge opportunity to make the buying experience online much better, smoother, and easier for mm-hmm. the client. And well, so that's well, the part of it that cool. the part of it that's interesting to me. So uh, I'll come from a fitness perspective because uh, you know that's uh, our, my expertise, right? You can follow workouts that are really well written and and done, and they'll be good. They'll be effective, but nothing will ever surpass an individualized workout. One that is designed specifically for your body 
your lifestyle, your motivation levels, your fitness history, like nothing's ever going to beat that. It's impossible because it's individualized. Uh, the Pluto pillows are literally individualized to you. And I don't know of any other company that does this. So you go on their website and you enter in things like your height, your weight, does your head get hot or cold? Do, the pillow that you currently use, is it too hard for you, too soft for you? How tall is it? Like all these, there's all these different questions and then they literally design and individualize a pillow for you mm-hmm. and that obviously is going to make a huge difference. Yeah, and then ship it directly to your house. And then you get, and so so Jessica did the whole process yeah. for me and then I, I got the, the pillow and I'm like, well, let's see what happens, you know, and huge difference. Yeah, I started sleeping on my, the biggest thing for me was that like my head gets really hot. And so, like, if I have the wrong type of pillow, like, it'll there just... was a, there was a joke there, Doug. I know. Was it? Oh, yeah, I left it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like joke Tourette's right there. Um, yeah, no. So yeah, my head does get hot. It's a real thing. Um, <laughs> and uh, the engine is working hard. In yeah, there, huh? you know, always just 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 moving. You know, gears. Um, and so, like, at, at night that wakes me up. I have to like, I have the window open, like everything else to try and make everything cool. But then still, my pillow like just radiates with heat so um that was something that uh, i've noticed and, and this is kind of a selling point on their end is that the, the whatever you know type of materials they use has really helped uh, kind of cool it down a bit totally speaking of heat you know obviously jessica's in her uh, third trimester of oh, yeah. pregnancy she has turned into a uh like a heat generating furnace yeah. Like, hey. Now, now, before she got pregnant, Jessica needed the house had to be. This is not exaggeration. Se- between seventy three and seventy four degrees. That's how. Oh. And she liked to sleep that way. Oh. Okay. Yeah. She was always cold or whatever. It's like the jungle. Oh, oh. now like ACs at sixty five. No sheets. Don't touch me. Like she's like I put my hand on her. Just like my little hand on her back. Just. Oh, I just want to feel. Oh, get your hand She's off. Turned me. into me and Adam. Oh, yeah. dude, and, and I feel heat coming off her body. We had dinner uh, with my parents uh, the other day, and we were sitting outside, and we're in, under a patio and fans and all that. And she lasted about twenty five minutes. So I got to go inside and sit down. Just. Sweat and pour. I remember when Katrina made that transition too, oh, because yeah. that's obviously the battle in my house too, right? Is I'm I'm always trying to cool it down. She's always trying to keep it in the seventies, and that was like the only thing I could say that was my favorite part of the third trimester. Was right? That, right? <laughs> yeah. Was, like, everything else. Hey, I was, we're finally on the same climate. Yeah, exactly. We finally got on the same page where she was like, "Oh my god, it's so hot in here." I'm like, "Jesus, you're hot. I'm actually a little cold. This Dude. is nice." <laughs> oh, and then and then of course, and then just by part, I feel bad about this. She literally has to go pee every hour. Yeah. Every single yeah. hour, yeah. and then there's no room in there. Oh, dude, she go yeah, and the baby's like kicking the the her bladder. Yeah. Like she went pee, we went for a walk. You know, we go for ten minutes. She's like, I have to pee really bad. We got to go back. Got to walk back. Go pee. I'm like, babe, why don't we just put a diaper on you? Because otherwise, we're not gonna be able to do <laughs> the walk. We I mean, can't it's so do the logical, walk. right? Yeah, you know yeah. Yeah. what not to yeah. say to your pregnant exactly wife. Exactly what she wants to hear. And then you yeah. know she got all yeah. sensitive. About yeah, that. yeah. <laughs> weird. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I mean, they have lace ones now, right? Yeah, <laughs> no. I feel, uh, we could get into this, babe. I'll wear one too. Oh god. I'm just kidding. Oh, anyway, yeah, I don't hear uh, about that. Adam, your really short shorts uh, are showing off your really long legs. Uh, Justin, you, you've got really short legs. I just noticed too. What do you mean I got short? I don't think you got long legs. I think you got. I, kinda... I got like proportional legs. Do you really? <laughs> yeah, yeah with, with amazing caps. No, I feel like you got like kind of shorter legs. You know what I mean? Which <laughs> I, gives you good strength. Maybe. I. I mean, I, I feel like it's pretty balanced. It gives you a solid base. Okay. Or whatever. Anyway. Uh, uh, spe- <laughs> yeah. I'm glad. Speaking of I'm glad which, you're noticing this. Speaking of which, <laughs> yeah. I just set up a transition. Yeah. Uh, so Viori uh, is is now making the inseams on their pants for women. It gets longer because oh my women God. do. This have, was your commercial transition. That's it right uh, there. That was uh, terrible. That was my best attempt. No, good. <laughs> I, yeah. yeah, long legs, short legs, longer le- <laughs> pants seams in the no. Viore pants. They, well, for what they I know that. Uh, so I'm always rocking their their banks and then their what are the other shorts that I really like? Core, core, core yeah, core, yeah. Banks, banks and core shorts are the, my favorite. Didn't, didn't you say you were going to get like the rip proof? Pants uh, or whatever? Rip stop? Yeah, well, the rip stop pants, because um, with the, ironically, right? Like, so I had a pair before. They're khaki and they're great because I, I love having at least one pair of khaki pants and I totally shredded, like, from the crotch down to my knee, uh, a big old hole. And so, uh, thankfully, though, they take them back and then they replace them. So I didn't even have to, like. I love that about yeah. they're, they're, They definitely, and I don't know who do, who else does this online, like direct to consumer stuff. I imagine that it's more challenging to do that. Uh, it's a direct. lifetime guarantee. Yeah. So if you, they're like Nordstrom's. You know, Nordstrom's is like, the, that's, what they're, that's what they were known yeah. for, right? Like if you High buy service. something, you've had it for yeah. two months. 
button falls off, and then you walk yeah. into Nordstrom's, no receipt, no nothing, give it to them. And then I bet you always just shopped at Nordstrom's. I did a little bit, yeah. yeah. Do you use Grey Poupon mustard, fancy. too? That was too big. <laughs> you are not allowed to make fun of fashion stuff. No, no, no I'm just saying. Captain, uh, yeah. Captain Target. I'm just saying. Over yeah. Here. Yeah. Hey, no, yeah, hey guy. Yeah, guy. Yeah. Feels good, looks good. What are, yeah. what are you going to yeah. do? Kmart sucks. <laughs> yeah. You're like, no, you're like Nicolas Cage over yeah. there. Yeah. De- uh, definitely oh, sucks. my God. No way, dude. That's crazy. I don't even know how something like that happens because you have to be a moron and not understand, like, how property tax works to not like start to do the math. Like you buy, I mean, that's one of the uh, the bummers about even living in California. You, you buy a, you know, maybe you make enough money and you can finally afford a multi-million dollar house. Well, that's great. Like you, whatever you did to get to that point, but you got to be able to, uh, the property taxes on a multi-million dollar house in California, you're paying, you know, th- two, $3,000 a month, which is like more than like a lot of people's mortgages in the rest of the country that you have to pay every single month. So you go out and buy multiple, mi- you know, $10 million properties. You got to be a moron to think that even if you're doing movies all the time, you have to think that like that, that can never stop if you buy that many properties. It That's, just goes to show yeah. that if you don't have good financial, uh, you know, uh, a good relationship with money, good yeah. financial health, that giving someone more money isn't going to solve the problem. It's just like the question that we get all the time whenever we post our Qua meme in the, on, on Instagram. The, a real common question is, uh, how would you feel if they invented a pill that you could take that would just make you lean and fit? And my answer to that is you wouldn't – fine, you'd have the physical uh, you know, effects of it, but you would still have not developed the skills to have a good relationship with your body – with fitness and with health. One of the side effects of working out and eating right is you look lean and all that stuff, but there's so many effects that you have from developing that that healthy relationship. So you could give somebody who has a shitty relationship with food and exercise a pill to make them fit. You would solve one problem out of a thousand that, that th- those poor relationships create. It's no different than like the story about Nicolas Cage. Well, yeah, I mean, the the lottery winners and Biggest Loser, to me, are the, the best examples right. of that, yeah. you know, because we have, you know, we've got, we've had enough lottery winners to go back and look at the, the stats on that. We've had enough people go through Biggest Loser and the, you know, the bankruptcy and poor rate of people that win the lottery is ridiculous. Mm. I believe it's up in the 80%. They're top. buying boats. And yeah, nonsense. just because you, you, I mean, there's a lot that happens Getting to a place where you even reach a million dollars, there's a lot of things that you have to learn along the way Exactly about that in exactly. order to keep that kind of money. And if you just get to be at the top of the mountain, like your analogy you like to give, and it's totally different. You, you didn't you didn't put in all the work to get to climb the mountain and right. the behaviors- just helicoptered up there. Yeah, the behaviors and the habits that it takes to make that kind of money and to keep that kind of money- uh, so you go right through it. And the same thing goes for the person who's trying to lose weight. Like, yeah, you can put these, these, you know, you know, 10 obese people in this, you know, uh, three month boot camp where they don't get, you know, they're not in real life and hammer the shit out of them, starve their body. And of course they'll lose a ton of weight, but that's not real life. That's not how it works. And so if they don't, yep. if they didn't put in the practice to do that, and I believe like the stats on like that, where there's, you know, there's still like a 20% success rate. I don't even know how they factor that in because is it, is that forever or is that just for the last, next three years? Cause some people have the resiliency and the discipline or they've gone out and they bought a personal trainer to keep them going. Like some of these biggest loser people, I would, I would bet you that in 10 years from now, almost all of them, if not all of them, are back to the same Those way. are skills that yeah. take time to develop. They're difficult. They're possible, though. But if you don't develop those skills, um, you're not going to be in a good situation, even if you're gifted all the, the results that you think are all of the, the value that you get from developing those skills. It reminds me, there was a, I don't remember who it was. It might have been Bill Gates, uh, a billionaire, where he went to lunch with uh, a reporter and when he went to tip, he gave the guy a uh, you know like a a, thir- a twenty dollar tip or something like that. And the reporter said something to him like was kind of poking at him and said, you know, I went to dinner with your son, and your son gave the guy like a you know two hundred dollar tip. Why is that? And he says because uh, I uh, I'm a self made billionaire and my son is the son of a billionaire. In other words, I develop the skills right. that it takes to build wealth. My son just has this wealth. And so he doesn't have any of those skills. And this is true. When you meet those shitty, you know, wealthy people that act like crap, oftentimes they're not the ones that earned it. They're the yeah. ones that inherited it or it's been passed on. To exactly. Them. Yeah. You ever meet someone who's self-made 
and you tend to meet someone that's got some really good- They're pretty responsible. Yeah, and they've got really good uh, financial health and good habits in other parts of the life. Just like if you meet someone who has a really good lifelong relationship with, uh, with fitness and nutrition, it requires so much discipline and so much skill that it bleeds into other things. I think the same thing is true about you know building a business. I agree. Our first question is from Grant Satterthwaite. How would you recommend programming isometrics and dynamic tension for strength? Probably one of the most underrated, undervalued yes. uh, exercise techniques uh, in resistance training. The benefit and the value that you get from training and utilizing isometrics or dynamic tension is they're well documented. We decades of studies mm -hmm. on high level athletes, Olympic lifters, uh, power lifters now um, start to utilize some of the stuff. The value with this type of training is tremendous. Super, super undervalued. I almost never see anybody program this in their workouts, and that's too bad. Yeah, it's interesting. Like uh, I, I never saw it. I never saw it in the gym. I never saw anybody utilizing it until uh, I got into college and uh, was around some strength conditioning coaches that uh, were using this with athletics and and you know ways to improve very specific mechanics with their athletes uh, and uh, to do that in a way that wasn't as damaging as you know powerlifting and some certain things like that where. Uh, you know, they were like, they're really trying to hone in on, on developing and building and strength in that specific skill. And so it's, it's very much uh, an underutilized uh, method that's out there that uh, we tried our best to kind of incorporate them in some of our, our um, MAPS programs, mainly because I just don't think people have been exposed to them and, and the, the benefits of them. Uh, I, I used it a lot as a trainer. Did you guys use it a lot? I used it a lot as a trainer. I, I did, and I used it more as a correction Towards the end of my Okay, method, yeah. but I, I, you know, the performance aspect, I also underrated, and I, I'm just too bad at yes. it. So I agree. So I, that, that's how I did not use it the way uh, we've programmed it in some of the programs. Um, which, Matt's performance. That's why we put it in there, right? Yeah. No, it's phenomenal in there, and that that is not the way that I used to use it. Like what, how I used to love to use it as a trainer was as a way to teach a good form and technique, right? Mm -hmm. Like so, one of the hardest things is when you and we've kind of like talked about this a little bit where. You know, I, if I got a client and I they had an athletic background, I could always tell. And Justin talks about like this too, like how that was like the easy client for him, and he really struggled with the opposite side, right? Mm -hmm. And so did I. I think a lot of trainers do. Like, you know, it, it, when you've been training for a long time and you've got good form and technique, and then if you've trained athletes, they pick things up really quick. Then all of a sudden, you get a person who's been an engineer for thirty years of his life, never lifted a weight ever, and you got to train them, and it is so foreign. That it's like you could demo the exercise slow and a hundred times, and they the, the, they just do do not have the the communication there. It's just not there the body awareness, and so getting them to perform an exercise uh, correctly, I would have to like break it in segments. Mm -hmm. Like, and so I'll use like a bicep curl because it's so basic for people to visualize. But I mean, I would take somebody and I would like here's your starting posture. I'd have them holding dumbbells or something, right? And then I would I would get I would manually grab their shoulders, put them into place, pin their elbows by their side, and then I'd say, okay, now I let let them bring it up like six inches, and, and then hold it then there. hold it there. Yeah. Now hold that position. Then I'd go back and correct because right away their shoulders would collapse forward, mm -hmm. elbow would rock forward. I'd bring the elbows back. I'd pull the and they'd be holding that position, and I'd want them. And then I want them to feel like that's where you need to be. Now yeah. bring it up again, and then I bring them up a little bit, another six more inches. Have to go kind of adjust their body again, and I used it like that a lot to get somebody who has really bad body awareness and, and doesn't have good form and technique to coach them through that, like literally inch by inch. And that was like, I would say the single best thing I did for helping clients that did not have that athletic background or did not have a tr weight training background, that exercise was so foreign to them to get them to get the movement down. Yeah, similar, but uh, more on the performance end of it. Like, is So uh, I would look at sticking points. And I know a lot of uh, uh, power lifters and people that are like actually competing and lifting weights, uh, they, they've actually broken it into segments like you're talking about in terms of where those sticking points might lie. So for a squat, you know, that bottom portion is is, is you know usually the you know the most difficult the most challenging uh, amount to uh, be able to summon enough force to be able to drive everything back up with the weight so I would actually have them stay in that position and really like 
uh, connect to it and squeeze and you, you know like it's amazing how much more uh, you can recruit by just like literally focusing on squeezing harder and, and, and training your body to, to give you and provide you more force in that uh, susceptible position. Now, do we explain the difference between isometrics and dynamic tension? We no, didn't yet. no, no. So you, 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 there's different ways to, to strengthen these types of, of training, uh, you know, positions. One is to push against an immo immovable object. So it would be like, uh, I'm underneath a bench press the, the weight, let's say, rather than having weight on the bar, I push the weight up against the, the safeties. So the bar is up against the safeties. I'm not going to lift the whole cage, and I just push into that, for example. Right. You're not moving at all. You're not moving it, but yeah. you are pushing hard against an immovable object or the wall or something like that, right? The other way is to create tension intrinsically, mm -hmm. which would be like just pretending to push against something real hard but flexing all my muscles and creating a lot of tension. Now, here's the things you need to understand about this these techniques. They build muscle and they build strength. And the way they do it, first off, they build muscle in, in, in similar ways to other forms of resistance training where you're creating damage, you're sending a mu muscle building signal, all that stuff. But there's this other unique uh, thing about these types of training that, m that they're better at than almost any other form of resistance training. They are excellent at increasing the, the outage, increasing the, the, the juice that the central nervous system can send mm -hmm. to muscles, the connections. So think about it this way, right? Imagine you have a laptop and the laptop uh, it has a wire connecting to a big uh, robot and you give the robot commands with the computer and you tell the robot to lift something heavy or whatever. The problem is the robots, uh, the communication is limited by the skinny little you know USB wire that I have attached to the robot. Now, I could attach really fat cables that allow more juice, more power, better communication to go to the robot, in which case the robot performs better. This is not unlike your body. Your muscles don't just act on their own. They act because the central nervous system communicates to them. You literally send a command to these muscles. This is why somebody who, let's say, has been bedridden for a long time or in a coma doesn't just jump out of bed mm -hmm. and is able to walk. Besides the fact that the muscles themselves are weak and atrophied, they have like no more connection to the muscle. Or someone who got a stroke, for example, where they have to relearn how to move and walk. So those are extreme examples. But isometric and, and dynamic tension increases the power. So when you can increase the power, you get now a louder muscle building signal. You lift heavier weight, it's under better control, you feel stronger. And look, Bruce Lee was a huge fan of it. This is when I really first started paying attention to it. I remember reading about Bruce Lee's workouts and he wasn't particularly strong in traditional sense. Like he couldn't bench press a ton of weight, mm. but he could do crazy things like hold a 100 pound dumbbell at arm's length uh, for long periods of time with just right. in incredible tension. And just and generate power like uh, with a with one inch punch he, kind of thing. He was well known for having this incredible uh, power and rigidity in his in his wrists and his arms when you would punch or in his yeah. ankles and feet when you would So kick. to the dynamic tension, like if you think of it too as, as just creating more tension through these types of movements. So if I'm doing a push up and I'm also then, you know, actively trying to turn my hands out, even though they're not moving anywhere, but I'm, I'm focusing on different areas uh, that I can increase the tension of muscles to recruit more of a louder uh, signal. So that way, you know, it, when you start to, to really like manipulate that and, and create more tension, the tension provides more security around the joints mm. and so now this command gets louder as a result because everything is telling the body that we're secure we're you know we're stable we're able to uh now apply even more force so that way you know you actually get stronger overall yes and there's a few ways you can implement this by the way the athletes that uh inadvertently on accident utilized uh tension movements or bodybuilders believe it or not mm -hmm. uh just through flexing and posing <laughs> You know, Arnold used to talk about um, as he'd get up to a competition, he would practice posing three times a day, and he noticed it sharpened and hardened his muscles. What was probably happening, aside from getting leaner, was that his his muscle he was able to control them better. But in terms of programming, there's a few different ways you could do it. You either can start your workout out with these types of uh, techniques, which give you better connection to the exercises when you get That's into them. That's where I like to use it. That's how you. I like to use it that way also. The bodybuilder method. They tend to do it at the end or in between sets. So you're doing your traditional workout. Let's say you just finished working out your legs. Now at the end of your workout, you're doing the squeeze and you're focusing on tension and isometrics. I've done both. 
I think both have their value. The one I prefer is what, like when Ad, you just said, Adam, I like to do it at the beginning of the work. I just feel stronger in all my lifts. You know, this conversation uh, reminds me, I've been meaning to shout out our buddy across the pond, uh, Coach Eugene Tao. He, uh, when the whole COVID thing hit, he was one of the few oh, trainers yeah. that I saw do this. I and, saw him do that, yeah. And I just, I think, I, I love when I see coaches uh, that, that think this way. Um, I mean, I... I think you saw all over social media when you know COVID hit. Everybody's home. Everybody's lifting their couch. Yes, you saw all shit. these, the, all the creative, stupid exercises come out. You know, the soup can stuff, lifting the couches and doing weird shit, and just uh, and to me, that's that's all the simple-minded trainers went that direction. Yeah, curl your dog. You know? yeah, 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 and yeah, whatever. You know, for whatever reasons, whether you're just getting it for doing it for likes, or you really think this is a good way to teach clients, and he went all this direction. And I and he was and you, he he would every almost every day I saw a, a different exercise that he was sharing and like all he would use is like a towel mm -hmm. or a t shirt or something yep. and he'd show people how to get a great back workout leg workout through isometrics and using just a towel or a t shirt and to me that's just a sign of a really smart coach that understands the value of something like that and here's a great opportunity for people to pro that knowing that a lot of people probably don't use utilize it and here you are limited because you don't have a gym now. Now's a great time to yep. implement this into these, your routine. The, these techniques are some of the unsung heroes in mass performance. When we get comments and reviews, uh, this is a lot of times what people comment on and say, I did not realize mm -hmm. how big of an impact this would have. We don't talk about it a whole lot. I think we forget about it, mm -hmm. um, but it's extremely valuable. So in terms of programming, beginning or end of your workout, um, and you should be totally fine. That doesn't add too much in terms of damage to muscles. Can you overdo it? You, of course, you can overdo everything. But I would say, you know, a couple sets at the beginning of your workout uh, would probably just give you benefit and not really any detriment. Next question is from Wayne W. 1980. Why do processed foods add so much water between the skin and muscle for days after? What foods or supplements can reduce water retention after a holiday or cheat weekend? Uh, so sodium and, and carbs. Yeah. Oh, totally. I'll, I'll, I'll leave the second part for, of that question for you, Adam. You, mm -hmm. You're probably the, the most uh, well-versed on getting water out from under the skin. This is a, a, a total bodybuilder skill. I think mm -hmm. they're the experts uh, of the fitness world on that particular part. But the reason why you may hold water with processed food, this, is, this was a great conversation I would have with clients. You know, When they would ask me about nutrition, Inevitably, the sodium question would come up. Um, you know, I need to reduce my sodium. Should I be salting my food? Should I not be salting my food? And I would say to them, and this is true, I'd say for most people, if you avoid heavily processed food, go ahead and salt the shit out of your whole foods and you'll eat fine. Your sodium intake will be just fine. Yeah. You People do not realize how much sodium is contained in processed foods. Yeah. I eat very little- it's Buried in there. I eat very little processed foods. In fact, I almost, almost usually I almost no processed foods. But when I eat my whole natural foods, my steak, my vegetables, my potatoes, my rice. Sal whatever. carries salt in his purse everywhere he goes. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> everywhere he goes. I don't have a purse. We go. <laughs> it's a purse. Yeah. Yeah. Everywhere we go, he literally pulls it out and he and he salts food wherever, whatever we're eating. So, but that's just it. I used to tell the clients the same thing. If you're eating whole foods, season and salt all you want. Because you it, if I, I it's saw it's hard to eat too much salt when you're doing it. Well, that there, way. I saw I saw a really good comparison one time. Maybe Doug can find it online, but it, they showed like, you know, one meal of eating at McDonald's or eating out somewhere the amount of sodium that you intake like you couldn't pour enough table salt on your food mm. like in a week's time to like account for like one meal of eating out it's that crazy of a difference so yeah if you're if you are uh, eating processed foods and you're going to get a, a tremendous amount of sodium now it, sodium isn't necessarily something bad for you though it's okay but you need to understand that if you on on an average day let's say for the most part you eat whole foods pretty regularly and then every once in a while you enjoy yourself. You go have a, a big old pizza or you order five guys or in and out and you and you go to town. Well, what you need to realize is that one meal, if you are somebody who eats whole foods most of the time, even seasoning and salting, and then you have that one meal out of nowhere, and, and this happens to me because I, like Sal, eat mostly whole foods, but I do have processed foods in my diet for sure. And I always know right afterwards, the next 48 to 72 hours, my body holds on to more water. And yep. it, ta it takes about that long. So I always tell clients, that are asking questions around this to to really take a snapshot of about forty eight to seventy two hours. Don't allow a, a day of eating that might that might have been inconsistent for you, meaning you probably ate processed foods or something like that out of the ordinary. 
to affect our what our plan is, like what we're doing macro wise, what we're doing mm. exercise wise, because there's a very good chance your body's holding on to additional water for the next 48 to 72 hours. That's what it'll naturally take to kind of pull that pull that out and then look at after three days and tell me if you still feel the same way you felt after that night of pizza. So that's the first uh, bit of advice. And so here's things they take into consideration. Uh, one, eating out, uh, they, they, they normally grossly under calculate what the calories are. They're allowed, FDA allows them a good, I think 20 to 30% to be off. So a lot of times the food that's what it says it is, it's much higher in carbohydrates, calories, and possibly sodium in there. So you got to factor that in. And for every three grams of carbohydrates that you intake, your body holds three ounces of water. So if you eat out and you and you and you and that a processed food, there's a good chance it has more carbs and calories than you expected. There's a good chance it has more sodium than you expected. And then in addition to that, your body's naturally going to hold on to more water. So and that could be for depending on the person on how much water and how big you are, uh, that could be anywhere from two to nine pounds of water that your body can hold on. Like when I was up in the 240 range and drinking a gallon to two gallons of water every day, I could my weight would fluctuate nine pounds through the night based off of what I was doing with carbohydrates, sodium, and water. So you have to take that into consideration. Um, the, a natural way to pull water would be the next two days after you had that high sodium day is to pay attention to your sodium intake, have it a little bit lower, pay attention to your carbohydrate intake, have it a little bit lower. And then asparagus. Asparagus has something in it. I can't remember what it is uh, that helps naturally pull water out. So mm. that was like a, a natural way to do it. And that, and that is what I would recommend. I would not recommend any extreme things. I wouldn't say for you to cut drinking water. I wouldn't tell you to cut sodium completely out. I wouldn't tell you to complete cut uh, carbohydrates. And I wouldn't tell you to go take water pills just to pull it out. You could go sweat in a sauna. That'll help out. So sweating sweating in a sauna, eating asparagus, and reducing the carbohydrate and the sodium intake from what the processed food day, those things. are, And then also uh, being easy on yourself, recognizing that it may take two to three days for it to kind of completely Well, move. so I pulled up some interesting statistics here, okay? So just to give people an example of uh, the amount of salt that's in things that you wouldn't even realize, Instant plain oatmeal. But does anybody ever think instant plain oatmeal has you salt think in of it? Oats. Yeah, it's all. It's four hundred to five hundred milligrams of of sodium in instant oatmeal. Something that you would think has no salt at all. Another statistic that I I, I pulled up was that most people get seventy seven percent of their daily sodium in processed foods. That's where it all comes from. So is that just to up the shelf life for the most part for those products? It's the and taste, taste, it's and process. Taste, taste and, yeah, taste and shelf life. Yeah, it is. And so it's like, you know, you I salt the hell out of my food, but it's all whole natural food. I guarantee you my sodium intake is perfectly fine within the the range that they'll give you for healthy. But I know when I eat processed food, uh, I know I feel it. I can feel it. I get the bloat and then I get really thirsty. This is when I wake up in the middle of the night and need to drink a glass of water. Oh, yeah. That's really strange. This, is, this reminds me too of annoying conversations I used to have to have with clients that went to the doctor and then the doctor told them they couldn't salt food and shit. What uh, a dumb piece of advice. I used advice. to hate that. Like it, You're going to reduce your sodium barely by doing that. I know. And it's like, that is not where the problem is. It lies in your Mickey D's you had last night yeah. or the you know extra large pizza. Deep dish pizza. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's where the, the problem or lies. Or even the can of soup or yes. the, the the right. pasta sauce that came out of the jar or, you know, stuff like that that you wouldn't even Soy realize, yeah. you know, that the, even things you don't think are salty, they add a ton of sodium uh, to processed foods. Uh, if it's natural, it's you're fine. Go for it. No. Next question is from Benelux Ryder. What are your thoughts on intra-workout carbs? Are they really necessary if pre and post nutrition is well planned out. I think it's funny. Yeah. So intra workout <laughs> carbs. You just is, got marketed to. Yeah. <laughs> is is like drinking like a sports drink or you know carbohydrates while you're training. Studies show that there is a benefit for people who are working out for long periods yeah. of time. Yeah. Like so if, rigorously. Yeah. So if you're like you know you're doing like a two hour, three hour, four hour like session where you're hiking like crazy, kayaking you know, running or you're doing a really, really long drawn out yeah. session, then it makes sense to, to have carbohydrates because then your body can use those 
to replenish glycogen stores to give you more of that energy. It, it's such a splitting hairs conversation. For most people. It's, for, it's, for, it's everybody, yeah, for everybody. For everybody. Even, the, even who, the example you just gave, it's still splitting hairs. It yeah. really is. I mean, and, and here's the deal. like Because uh, my peers, when competing, uh, did stuff like this. And you know what? Hey, if you are, you know, you're tracking sleep, you're measuring, you're weighing your food, you're weighing yourself, you're tracking your ounces of water every day, your sodium intake, like you were like dialed on every aspect of training and eating. Like, okay, sure, play with that. You know, you can do that. But I mean, I can tell you uh, from my experience personally, I mean, I worked my way all the way up to a professional bodybuilder without worrying about that stuff, yeah. without worrying about the timing of my meal post-workout, without doing any sort of an intro workout, carbohydrate, like none of that stuff is is going to make a big difference. And that, and I'm talking on that level, even on that level, it is still splitting hairs for the average person. Is it, is it worth it? No, no. now no. for a waste of time for endurance athletes who are doing long bouts of endurance, there is benefit. Sure. Yeah. You're yeah. a marathon runner, you're an OC racer and you're pushing, you know, hour, two hour uh, long runs and with exercise or yeah. doing it multiple times a day. Then it makes a difference. Sure. And, and studies support that. But I will say this, and here's the reason why it makes a difference. Okay. When you're an athlete and you're going to go do a marathon or go do a three or four hour mountain bike ride or whatever, your body only has the capacity to store something like six to 8,000 calories worth of carbohydrates in liver and in muscle. And for high performing athletes doing these long duration- You could burn all that. You could burn it all out and you're gone and you hit the wall mm -hmm. and then you're screwed. There is another option. The other option is to be is to be keto adapted, mm. go into these endurance sessions that require low level, low to moderate levels of exertion for long, long periods of times. Right. Because even a lean athlete will have something like thirty to forty thousand calories worth of fat that they can use and convert into ketones. Not really something to consider if you're an explosive athlete. Not if you're explosive, yeah. but if you're like a, a long distance runner or you're right. going to go. I remember when I was- Zach Bitter did this. Zach that, Bitter did this. Yeah, I, I remember when I was keto adapted, uh, both Jessica and I were keto adapted and I never kayak. I'm not an endurance athlete. I lift weights, but we went kayaking uh, in Lake Tahoe. We were supposed to find this campsite, got totally lost, ended up kayaking for, I don't remember what it was, like five or six hours with no food or anything. And I t for sure thought, well, I'm going to get, like, we're going to need to pull over. Something's going to happen. We're, we were both fine. And it was because we were running off of ketones the whole time. Now, if I was not keto adapted, I'm pretty sure I would have hit a wall and totally, uh, you know, conked out or whatever. So that's your other option. If you're lifting weights, uh, it's almost, it's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. It's not going to do you any, really any benefit to have carbohydrates. Yeah, there's no major advantage. In the middle of your workout. Next question is from Triana Alonzo. Should foam rolling be done before or after a workout? How often and what are the benefits? It depends what? on the workout, I would say. So foam rolling has benefits because it can improve movement patterns. But if you don't strengthen uh, and, and do correctional exercise to prevent the bad patterns from coming back, then it's a, a waste of time. Mm -hmm. I like to foam roll before correctional uh, exercise just to give me that better movement pattern. It, uh, if I'm doing heavy lifting, I like foam rolling after. At the end. At the uh, end. I actually prefer that. And mainly, too, to get me in sort of that parasympathetic state. Like, it, it, I, I use it as a tool to kind of calm my body down and also, like, focus on areas that have been really restrictive in my exercises. And I want to address them while, you know, I, I, they're already warm. They've already gone through, uh, you know, the workout and uh, to get me to kind of calm down and then uh, to also address anything that I can improve upon going into then the next workout the next day. I like talking about the foam roll because it was something that um, I didn't use at all for the first five years or so as a trainer uh, until I, I started getting uh, knee pain. I uh, started to get knee pain and uh, found out like how tight uh, my IT was, right? And then I started to foam roll it and saw a huge difference when I would foam roll and then go play basketball. And that was like, then I was married to it. Then like anytime before I trained legs or did anything, I was constantly foam rolling, foam rolling. And then I was introduced into mobility, and training w with that on a regular basis before I would, and then mm -hmm. I completely eliminated the foam roll. Yeah, so you didn't need it anymore. I that. the only time, and every once in a while, you'll see see me pull ours out because we have them here. And if I do that, it's because I overreached in a, a training session quite a bit, typically in legs. 
you know, I was going real heavy on squats or chasing a PR. And then the next day, I'm so sore that my gait is off. Mm. I'm kind of limping a little bit. Or, you know, you got that that after like hard training session of legs, your walk where you look like you have a stick up your ass. Like, if I'm walking like that, then I will get down and I will foam roll to relieve that to get me walking normal again. Mm -hmm. But then I'll just do mobility stuff before I train. I, I like that is the only time I use a foam roll. I use it as a band aid right now. Yeah. Because it doesn't, and that's all it really is. And that was the 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 part that I was missing when I was using it in the first, you know, part of my or the back half of my career when I started to use it all the time before basketball. It's like it became a thing that I was like, oh, I have to do this oh, yeah. before I lift. Yeah, mm -hmm. I have to do this before legs. I have to do this before basketball because it helped, and I noticed a difference from it. But what I didn't realize I was doing was I wasn't addressing the root cause. There was there was an issue with my feet and my hips that was causing this constant tightness in my IT that mm -hmm. I wasn't addressing the mobility in my hips. I wasn't addressing the mobility in my ankles and my feet and the, the connection that I had, my feet, my foot strength. Yeah. None of those things were being addressed. I was just constantly, what because of those things, I was getting this really tight IT that was hurting. It felt like a knife in the side of my thigh all the time to the point where I ended up getting bursitis in my hips. So I was constantly like, foam rolling to fix that but it was never fixing it it was just mm -hmm. relieving Temporary it temporarily mm -hmm. it wasn't until i got into mobility and i started to really spend time doing 90 90 and combat stretch and lizard with rotation and doing uh scorpions and like really focusing on my uh mobility drills then it got to the point where i completely eliminated foam roll it's yeah. like useless to me now yeah. unless it's just a temporary relief absolutely if it's used in conjunction with a correctional exercise program to promote better movement so that you can then get into yeah, unlock better movement yeah better mobility positions and more connection then the foam roller is beautifully used if it's used as a band-aid it's really no different than uh, taking advil because you bang your head against the wall and never stopping the banging the head against the wall and that's true. I did the same thing, Adam. I, I found it. I used it. I'm like, wow, this works. And then I had to use it all the time, never really solving the problem. And then what ends up happening is slowly over time, because now you're training through the problem rather than correcting the problem, the problem slowly ends up getting worse. This much foam rolling worked before. Now I got to do this much more. Now all of a sudden it's not working like it used to. So you want to solve the issue. So I would not use it on its own as a solution, but definitely in combination with mobility exercises uh, to solve the root cause, then the foam roller is absolutely brilliant. And that's why I like to use it at the beginning of correctional exercise uh, workouts. But if I'm doing a regular workout at the end, I love it. At the end, I love foam rolling areas that might have been a little overworked in my workout. Like if I did, if I did for example, mm -hmm. let's say I did a heavy deadlift workout and uh, I really pushed it and I could feel the erector spinae muscles of my lower back or a little bit tight, and I'm like, wow, I, I pushed it a little too hard. At the end of the workout, I'll foam roll that area. Or let's say I did a lot of pull-ups, and I feel my, you know, my teres major muscle, which is at the top, uh, underneath your armpit kind of area, and I'm like, ooh, that feels a little bit overworked. Then I'll foam roll that at the end of my workout. Or if I did heavy rows, and my, you know, my forearm muscles uh, are a little bit tight, you know, then I'll use a foam roller or deep tissue massage. That that's how I like to use it with uh, with traditional workouts, but. If you use it with correctional exercise, then it becomes a very valuable uh, tool. Look, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio. What's up, everybody on YouTube? Come find us, Mind Pump Podcast on YouTube. Also, you can find all of us on Instagram. Uh, you can actually find Doug is on Instagram too. He's yeah. at Mind Pump Doug. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. The produce movement, so uh, like a, a crunch or a sit-up or twisting, Okay, that's a, that's a, a movement that it's doing intentionally. I'm trying to twist. I'm trying to crunch. But there's another part that a lot of people don't realize, which is anti-rotation or preventing rotation or preventing too much movement.